Andrea. Hi. Hi, Andrea. This is Brendan. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. How's life? Yeah, it's going pretty well. How's your life? Oh, you know, <laughs> okay. I'm enjoying the early morning Brussels. <laughs> ah, good. Yeah, that's right. You have a few hours uh, ahead of us, right? Right. How is it going? How are you going to organize? Uh, who goes first? Uh, so what we'll do is uh, an introduction of the uh, session and the panelists, and then uh, I'll set the stage briefly. And there are three uh, three issues um, that we'll go through. Um, the first being government and identity. And at that point, I'm going to do an intervention, uh, a video intervention from Naomi uh, that we pre-recorded. And yeah. uh, that'll be short. And then uh, we'll go to you and uh, allow you to uh, tell us about the European Commission's efforts. And uh, okay. maybe do the, if you could do five to seven minutes, uh, kind of bringing okay. us up to speed on that. Uh, and then we'll uh, open it to the rest of the panelists for their uh, input. And as we move through the other two uh, issue areas, um, I'll uh, certainly ask you if you have any input. Uh, and feel free to just uh, uh, jump in when you want. OK. OK, great. It sounds good. I don't know if you're going to be able to watch the video live. Uh, because they uh, can't run the uh, remote participation and the video at the same time. So. Excuse me, can you hear? Oh, I mean, I, I've seen the video. I watched the video last night, so okay, I know what the, uh, the colleagues are saying. So I hope at least to, to be able to, to listen in the Andrea. conversation. Yes. Can you hear me? Can you? Yes. Hear? Okay, Andrea, I'm. Ah, it works. Andrea, I'm. I'm going to the other workshop. Then I leave you alone. Huh? You don't need me. Okay. Hi, Megan. Hi. I didn't recognize your voice. How's life? Very okay. well. Life in <laughs> IGF is great. <laughs> okay, I leave you with, uh, with the okay. others. Okay, thank I'm you. Going to the IOT. Okay, ciao. Okay, so Andrea is there to look after yeah, everything. Thank okay. you. Right. Brendan? Yes, sir. Um, I'm, I'm seeing uh, a presentation windows with apparently uh, something to be loaded from on from Dropbox. Right. Um, our presentation going to be projected there, and I, um, am I going to see them uh, in the uh, presentation windows? Uh, yeah, we actually, we don't have any other slides from any of the uh, presenters, so okay. this is really the only thing that will be shared on that screen. So it's just the video Correct. from the colleagues from the Department of Commerce. Correct. Okay. Go ahead and get started. Okay. Good morning. Uh, we will be starting here in about uh, one minute. So if you uh, don't have a headset, please uh, get one. And uh, we're on channel one. So my you own. Can, you can use your own. You okay. Can use okay. Own. Fine. No, I use my own. And no presentation. Okay. Ah, ah here is the video. Why is it on? Okay, uh, Andrea, if you could uh, mute your microphone, that would be great. We have a little bit of background noise. Okay, good morning. Uh, welcome to Workshop 163, Governing Identity on the Internet. This is co-organized by the Citizen Lab at University of Toronto 
and also the Internet Society. I'm the moderator, Brendan Kerbis. I'm a postdoc fellow at the Citizen Lab and a contributor to the Internet Governance Project at Syracuse University. I'd also like to add a quick thanks to my co-organizer who helped uh, arrange all of these many details that go into a workshop, and that's Christine Runniger, uh, who is a senior policy advisor at, at ISOC. Uh, we have today a diver diverse group of experts to help us explore this topic. I believe we cover four continents and every stakeholder group. It's, uh, it's a small miracle we pulled it off. Um, so uh, and we also have uh, a remote participant, and we also have a pre-recorded intervention from someone who uh, is in the United States, and no matter what I did, I could not convince her to wake up at 2.30 in the morning to, to join a workshop. So I'll do brief introductions. Uh, to our, my left, we have Bill Smith, who's a technology, the technology evangelist at PayPal. Uh, he represents them in ICANN, IETF, uh, Air, IGF, AIR, and various other internet governance institutions. He's uh, participated in the de development of secure and privacy-aware digital identity standards as an officer and board member at the Liberty Alliance uh, and the Kantara Initiative, and as past president of OASIS, a standards development organization. Uh, next to Bill, we have uh, Malavika Jayaram, she is partner at Jairam and Jairam in Bangalore and also a fellow at the Center for Internet and Society. Uh, she's assisted on projects uh, uh, relating to IT law, data protection, privacy, and follows uh, the impacts around uh, identity projects that impact uh, free speech and other civil liberties in India. To my immediate left, we have Robin Wilton, who is the technical outreach for identity and privacy at the Internet Society's Trust and Identity Initiatives Group. He's formerly with Gartner's Identity and Privacy Strategies team, uh, where he specialized in public key infrastructure, electronic signature, single sign-on, and federated identity. To my right, I have uh, Mark Crandall, who's Senior Manager of Global Compliance for Enterprise Services at Google. Uh, Mark, sorry. <laughs> uh, he, uh, addresses security and privacy related matters, uh, compliance related matters regarding Google's cloud-based services, uh, dealing with privacy, law enforcement, system security, and other areas. And finally, to uh, my far right, I have, uh, we have Milwaukee Chango, who is with the, uh, is the African Internet Policy Coordinator for the Association for Progressive uh, Communications. Uh, he uh, is a scholar as well and recently completed a social, social historical inquiry into identification systems uh, with a particular focus on emerging internet-based identity systems and protocols. In addition, he also has some practical experience in the internet governance arenas, uh, including ICANN's uh, generic name supporting policymaking organization and focusing on various policies related to who is in other areas. So, setting the stage, how we govern uh, identifiers in general underlies many of the debates here at IGF. Uh, the policy choices that we make around different types of identifiers from, uh, we've heard discussions of new GTLDs, IP addresses, those debates, uh, those uh, identifiers impact debates on a range of issues from privacy and free expression, access and openness to copyright enforcement and cybersecurity and beyond. The premise of this workshop is that we're in the formative stages of governance for a new set of identifiers. That is, identity and the various attributes that are associated with individuals, with you and me. Uh, these identifiers, identity, is already important and they're becoming increasingly contested on the internet. Governing identity on the internet will present some enormous challenges with regard to differing views on the roles and responsibility of public and private sector in the governance of identity online. Governments have historically played an a role in offline identity, and we will examine whether that role is changing and how it is changing, and what is being proposed to address a perceived need for internet identity. It will also present challenges in developing governance mechanisms 
determining the technical services, the institutions, the legal and organizational frameworks that might underpin and foster the interoperability of transnational internet identity. Where will these activities happen? Who will be involved in shaping them? And finally, it will present challenges for identity and rights and the need to reconcile public policy and security objectives while protecting individual rights like privacy and freedom of, freedom of expression. How will the process of achieving this balance be accomplished in identity governance? So the structure of this is we'll introduce an issue area, uh, set the stage a little bit, have some interventions from our panelists, uh, open it up for discussion to the other panelists, and uh, if uh, time allows, I'll take one or two questions uh, in each issue area. Uh, from the audience. We have a small enough group here that we can probably have a pretty uh, interactive dialogue. So, issue number one, the role of government in identity. Uh, the OECD did a, a great report in 2011 identifying 18 uh, OECD countries that were actively pursuing national strategies for digital identity management. Uh, numerous other governments are pursuing identity management strategies. There are a variety of regional, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot one panelist, Andrea, Andrea, uh, Andrea Servita from the European Commission. Forgive me, please. <laughs> um, Andrea is with the, uh, he's the head of the Electronic ID Authentication Signatures uh, Legislation Team, which is a European Commission task force effort to lead the development, negotiation, and basic implementation of a proposal to ensure mutual recognition and acceptance of electronic identification across borders. So, uh, hello, Andrea. Hello to everybody. Um, and actually, that's a nice segue into where I was headed. Uh, so there are a variety of regional identity management efforts that are also underway in the European Union, including research funded by the European Commission's seventh framework program uh, the Global Identity Networking of Individuals eSupport Action, Gini SA, the Stork Project, which is uh, trying to establish a European EID interoperability platform, and also work by the European Network and Information Security Agency, ANISA. A recent report uh, to the Uni United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, uh, the American Bar Association identified building private sector cross-border and interoperable identity systems as the next big challenge. In fact, the private sector, businesses and users, uh, might already be considered the de facto providers of identity on the internet. From innumerable websites uh, requiring user and passer, pa password combinations to Google or Facebook's single sign-on services and other federated systems that allow identity information to be used across organizational and national boundaries, there is much identity activity occurring already. This, so, what are the territori territorially bound governments uh, doing to foster internet identity now? And what exactly is the purpose and scope of various national stra various strategies being implemented by governments, particularly those dealing with internet identity? Um, our first uh, intervention is going to be from Naomi Lefkowitz, who is with the Department of Commerce. It's a recorded intervention. Uh, she is with the National Strategy uh, for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace effort, the National Program Office at the Department of Commerce. So I'm going to go ahead and play the video. Uh, Andrea, you've seen it, but hopefully you'll be able to follow along with us. Uh, I'm Naomi Lefkowitz. I'm a senior privacy policy advisor at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, and I uh, work with the uh, National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace National Program Office, uh, which was called out uh, for uh, to come into existence from the, the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, which we fondly refer to as NSTIC. And, uh, and there are a couple of roles um, that uh, the strategy called out for the NPO, which was uh, one, for government to be a convener. Uh, and, and to that end, uh, this past summer, 
uh, we issued a grant to an organization to start up a steering group for the identity ecosystem and to pull together uh, uh, stakeholders from uh, across the spectrum, from you know from consumer and privacy advocates to identity providers and relying parties and government at all levels uh, to come together and to, uh, work to agree on the standards and policies that would underpin this identity ecosystem. So uh, otherwise be known as the identity ecosystem framework. Uh, another area that the MPO is working in is to sort of encourage the development of the marketplace uh, in particularly in areas where um, things are not already occurring. So to that end, uh, we put out, uh, we awarded $9.2 million in uh, grants to five pilots. Uh, and these pilots uh, in particular are, uh, need to be aligned and are aligned with the four guiding principles of NSTIC so that they are privacy enhancing and voluntary, interoperable, secure and resilient, and uh, cost effective and easy to use. And uh, finally, the other uh, big area where the NPO works is to facilitate uh, the federal government to be an early adopter of the identity ecosystem, in particular, uh, really to, for federal agencies to be relying parties to accept uh, externally issued digital credentials for use by citizens when they want to interact uh, with the federal government. And is it um, the uh, long-term goal of the NSTIC to facilitate consumer identity, so beyond access to e-government services? Yes, absolutely. So the vision of NSTIC brought vision that you know, any individual could uh, take, get an identity, a uh, digital credential from, uh, you know, any any trusted source. So it could be a, a commercial provider, it could be a public provider, uh, and they would be able to take that identity and be able to use it uh, anywhere that they need to use it, both in the private sector and the public sector. I think we really don't see the federal government as, as competing. Uh, the the goal of the steering group is a place for all of these stakeholders and all of these different trust framework providers to come together and try to create some uh, unifying standards and policies uh, with that actually and to disrupt their own uh, trust framework provider processes. Uh, it's really key, uh, we think, to uh, creating this vision of, of NSTIC is that we need a unifying accreditation system. Um, but that wouldn't necessarily mean that these trust framework providers wouldn't continue to exist under that, but that um, you know, trust can be understood in the same way across the system, even if there are different actors uh, implementing that trust. But we completely recognize that identity uh, is international and um, we need to be able to have you know, overarching and interoperable system and uh, individuals need to feel that they are protected in that system in similar ways, otherwise they won't be able or be willing to use their identity across national borders. Uh, so to that end, you know, certainly uh, there are international members of, of NSTIC steering group, and we also uh, certainly reach out with our counterparts across the world, in particular we've uh, had many conversations with uh, UK and and the efforts that they are working on there, uh, but uh, you know one hallmark of, of the NSTIC is that you know its um, basis in the private sector and the fact that there may be uh, many sources of identity both in the private sector and the public sector, and that the federal government is not the uh, sole source of of identity. Uh, Clearly, we think that privacy is absolutely key. It's one of the four guiding. Thank you. Okay, uh, so Naomi gave us a little bit of background about the uh, national strategy at, in the United States. Uh, Andrea, can you go ahead and give us a little bit of background about what's happening with the European Commission in their uh, proposal? Um, yes, I can. So again, good morning to everybody. 
Um, I'm Andres Servida, I'm from DG uh, Connect uh, of the European Commission in Brussels, and I'm leading the task force that was set up to coordinate the legislative uh, effort to define a legal framework to support uh, the interoperability and the legal recognition of electronic identification schemes and trust services. Um, at the EU level, um, there are a number of activities which I think the, the Chair has already alluded to, which go, dates back to 2008, when we started, because indeed of the regional dimension of managing identity, to, I would say, get the Member States to work together in order to make their effort towards uh, introducing uh, electronic identification means to become an opportunity for uh, citizen and uh, um, economic players in connection to not only accessing governmental services, but even more importantly, to have uh, new uh, possibilities and opportunities in the digital environment. Indeed, I think that uh, the European Commission uh, is confronted with a kind of mock-up of what is actually the nature of the challenges that we have globally in terms of governing identity, because on the one hand we have uh, a kind of mock-up of regional diversity that we do have going from north to south, from east to, to west in, in the EU concerning the attitude, the approach to what I may call the uh, management of identity in connection to what is the legal determination of what uh, is the identity of a person. In my country, I'm an Italian citizen, um, the identity of a person is actually provided by the government, that is, it's rooted in the culture and in the legal framework of the country. And of course, I mean, we have, I uh, would say, in the north of Europe, uh, countries uh, like the UK, but also, I would say, other countries uh, um, like Sweden, where the, I would say, determination of identity is a bit, I would say, of a different nature. And I think that this is, to some extent, uh, something that is to be taken into account uh, in connection to uh, what might be the effort to make uh, uh, on the global scale, the management of uh, identity, and even more importantly, to us, uh, the management of identification means uh, to become an opportunity for for everybody, for users, for people, for companies. Um, in terms of concrete activities, we started back in 2008 with projects like Stork, which was alluded to by the chair, which indeed brought together 14 EU uh, member states in, uh, I would say, in an endeavor that uh, uh, was um, to determine a kind of uh, baseline uh, technological infrastructure that will make electronic identification means to be interoperable at the technical level. Uh, when I say identification means, uh, it doesn't mean uh, uh, necessarily electronic identity in the sense of the equivalent of uh, an ID card as we have in the physical world. Indeed, we have uh, in Europe um, on seven uh, member states that have introduced uh, to date uh, electronic identity card as the equivalent in the digital world of what are the physical identification card. But we have more or less 10 countries that have introduced some kind of citizen cards, which means, uh, which are indeed electronic identification card for, for citizen to get access to public services at least. And, uh, I would say to possibly have access to other services, as it is it the case in Sweden, where, or in, in um, I would say, in Estonia, where the electronic identification means are available to to their to their to the citizens in those countries for them to have access to also private sector um, services. What we are we did with store was to start working with the member states towards, I would say, the development of interoperable framework to support the interoperability and recognition, technical recognition of the electronic means. And this has been accompanied with a number of, I would say, a more research-oriented type of project that uh, are somehow uh, have been looking at the way in which 
the management of uh, identifiers or the management of uh, credentials or the management of rights uh, digital in the digital world could be associated not just with identification steps but also with uh, indeed uh, authentication steps authorization steps no repudiation technology that would make possible a minimal disclosure of personal data and private data in order to indeed uh, protect the privacy without uh, somehow impeding citizens to access the, their, their uh, would say services in the digital world. This is important for two reasons. First, because uh, what we have uh, put forward in, uh, in June as a proposal for a regulation to, I would say, um, um, provide uh, a framework for electronic identification um, uh, means and trust services is indeed, I would say, um, um, considering the provisioning of such services as an economic opportunities, which is deeply rooted in the diversity of uh, the cultural context in which identity is being provided, but at the same time, does put, uh, I would say, for the focus on uh, put the focus on what is indeed the huge challenges and the huge opportunities that we do have ahead of us in making those identification means to become part of those uh, trust service, I would say, um, trust services that we can consider to be instrumental to, I would say, empower citizen in, uh, in, uh, in performing their uh, uh, transaction in the digital environment, to empower uh, companies to pursue their, uh, I would say, uh, business and uh, in, in innovation interest that they have and uh, therefore provide much uh, richer services to, to other uh, um, um, companies and, and citizens. And the last but not least, uh, to ensure that always that uh, responsibility and accountability will be there, in particular in relation to, I would say, legitimate interest from, from uh, governments uh, to pursue uh, public safety and public uh, uh, policy objectives in particular in relation to protection of uh, people, uh, protection of, uh, I would say, <coughs> minors, um, protection of privacy, but also, I would say, I would say uh, uh, protection of society from what might be, I would say, um, uh, criminals or, uh, or terrorists. And of course, the tension between what might be desirable from, uh, I would say, um, a governmental or law enforcement perspective vis-a-vis -vis what might be um, uh, desirable from society are, uh, to some extent, a detention between these uh, different perspectives is something that we believe would be reconciled if we would be able to pursue the, the, the development of, uh, I would say, framework, the trust frameworks that will make the management of identity to turn actually in, in, into management of credentials, management of rights, management of, uh, I would say, um, 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 data that will be um, minimal in connection to what is indeed the uh, need to provide uh, security to the transactions that we want to do. Great. This is thank, important thank, because thank we you, believe Andrea. the privacy Andrea? is indeed, I would say, and I finish here, okay. because we believe the privacy is for us an imperative. And this imperative is to become an opportunity, not a constraint. Great. Thank you, Thank you so much for that uh, detailed uh, information about <laughs> what the Commission is doing. So um, some immediate reactions that I have, and then I want to turn to our panelists. Um, well, first of all, is why do we have various national strategies when the Internet is a transnational space? I think that's um, one obvious question that, uh, in the room. And uh, why are we seeing uh, so much government activity in internet identity, and I uh, was wondering if uh, any of our panelists have an immediate reaction. I know Milwaukee, you've done some history uh, studies of history of government activity and identity. Do you have any comments? Thank you, Brandon. Well, the the obvious reason for me why uh, governments, national government governments, will step in to. Uh, put forward some strategy or plans to implement so digital identity is that, first of all, identity has always been a construct 
somewhere between uh, the individual entity that is to be identified and authority. And uh, um, authority is always involved in identity because there's, there's a need for someone to define what will go into that identity and also someone primary has interest for identifying those entities, in this case, uh, generally individuals. So um, in the digital, with the internet, there's a vacuum of digital authority as a default position. So given that a lot of transactions have been happening on the internet and there's no one unifying authority as uh, uh, in, the in, in, in what we could call the internet public space or the digital public space. Uh, the, the private operators, private businesses are having trouble to come up with some solution that will um, apply to anybody else beyond their own organizational boundaries. So that's a, pos that's a situation where um, there's a natural call for some kind of already established authority to come and try to uh, contribute to link the different pieces together in a way that uh, those pieces can recognize that entity as being the authority. So I think that will be the first, my first answer to that, uh, to that question. No. Thank you. Uh, Bill? Yeah, I guess um, my comments are similar in that um, governments have traditionally um, issued identity or, or uh, credentials, my passport, as an example, driver's license. Um, they use breeder documents to issue these documents from a range of things. Um, and they also indicate things like authoriza or, uh, authorization. As an example, on my driver's license from California, I am authorized as a Class C driver, which means I can drive a regular automobile. Um, I can't drive a truck. Um, and so I think the that governments are stepping in because there is, uh, as was mentioned, a vacuum here in a sense. Turns out it's, it's a pretty difficult space though. Um, it's partly why we're having this conversation. Uh, but I think it's a natural place for governments to attempt to go. Um, and we, you know, I, I think it's, uh, we should encourage some of this, but as uh, Brendan points out, how are we going to do that in a, you know, when we're transnational and I think um, having been a, a, a strong supporter for nearly a decade of the Liberty Alliance and the, sp the specs there, federated identity um, is a way to go um, for a number of reasons, and, and perhaps we'll get into those later. Thanks. Uh, great. So I, I know that we have some people in the audience who actually, uh, like uh, Liberty Alliance, uh, have their own trust frameworks in the private sector, um, and I'm wondering if there are any uh, questions or comments from the audience. Do we have a, a, a microphone? If you could please introduce yourself, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hi. My name is John Bullard from a company called Identrust, and we run a uh, global trust network through the world's regulated financial institutions. Um, one wonders whether there is not a lesson to be learned from what has been done in the world of the credit cards, uh, um, where Visa and MasterCard as global schemes cross all borders, and the one thing that the scheme has in common is a set of contractual agreements that those who supply the cards to end users all sign up to. And that's done under, of course, the law of private contract as opposed to nation state law. So one wonders whether there are lessons going way back to 1970s of, of how that was created that should be taken into the digital identity world of the 21st century. Great, thank you. Any follow-ups from our uh, panelists? Yep, go ahead. Yep. Bill Smith, PayPal. That, that actually was the model that the Liberty Alliance used. <laughs> um, and we, we used the term a circle of trust where co uh, by through contractual mechanisms people would agree to trust each other and the identities that um, w would come in and, and be used. So it, I, I agree, it is a, it is a model. Typically, uh, look for models in the real world, see if they can apply to the online world. Um, 
and because they're things that people understand. And actually, that's a, another point. Uh, actually, what I have noticed uh, sometime during these uh, discussions is that um, we we sometimes have problem with the semantic of this language because uh, the credit card uh, issue has been debated, of course, in the banking online banking industry, and. Uh, um, they generally, I know with JP Morgan Chase, they don't like talking about identity. They don't want to see this themselves as uh, identity providers. They, they, they are interested in um, being involved in uh, uh, issuing credentials. They make the distinction clearly between identity or identity token or some, uh, of some sort and credentials. With the credential, they don't commit themselves into um, uh, the assurance of identity. What they are interested in is that you have the necessary authori authorization to conduct some operations. So um, I guess we got caught up in uh, that semantic issue. We have started with uh, digital identity, uh, user-centric identity, etc. And now maybe you know the industry has to decide whether they are really talking about providing identity or just credential. Uh, a note about the government, uh, I, can, I can say that in a situation that is in a, in a transnational or international situation, we've seen the case of the passport. Uh, the history of passports started domestically, of course, and then uh, after the First World War, it has to be internationalized uh, in a formal way. So the world was like, a, I mean, it is still a partition of sovereign territories. And uh, the uh, national state came together to agree on some framework and recognize each other passports and recognize each other passports so that you can say the passports system is kind of, kind of inter interoperable at international level. Uh, now the problem with uh, internet is that with internet we are dealing with private com com competitive entities uh, interested in uh, for profit business and that is a different framework altogether compared to uh, na national states uh, negotiating together some kind of pr framework or treaty can, can, can I just can I just make I, I agree with you entirely um, but but in fact th th this identity document, this credential, if you will, uh, has one liability, and that's written inside the front page of the document, that basically if I get stuck the wrong side of some customs post, with a bit of luck, Her Majesty the Queen will come and rescue me. That's really the contractual uh, application, if you will, of this credential. The fact that we use this credential when we check into a hotel or do anything else, Her Majesty takes absolutely no liability for the fact that John is John. And th that, I think, is the difference. And what we're talking about in the, in, in the private sector, in the business world, is a liability. What happens if it goes wrong? What happens if the credential has expired or it's been misused or whatever? Where does the buck stop? And, and that, to us, the liability is the, is, is the critical point. Great. Uh, so this discussion about uh, trust frameworks and uh, contractual arrangements is actually quite germane into our next issue of how do we govern identity systems? Um, it's been suggested that uh, the rules, uh, that, that is the business, the technical, the legal rules for identity systems are in fact likely to be contract based, particularly to the extent that they are uh, intended to be deployed uh, at internet scale across jurisdictional boundaries. Uh, indeed, uh, we see numerous contract based arrangements uh, in the private sector already uh, to help manage transactions involving internet identity. Now, as noted uh, previously by uh, Naomi, uh, the approach in the U.S. government's NSTIC uh, is for a governance body that has been stood up to accredit actors, uh, that is, identity providers, relying parties, uh, and trust framework providers that agree to abide by a baseline of rules, uh, policies, and standards um, in the identity field. So, um, but we've, we've kind of hinted at how difficult it is, well, first of all, how different uh, it is for uh, governments to kind of negotiate a contract framework and uh, the private sector to possibly negotiate a, a baseline of, uh, 
of policies and standards. Um, I want to ask a question to Mark, though. Um, instead of uh, governing, uh, from the perspective of an individual company that is uh, heavily involved with its users, can you speak to the comp and, and providing services uh, that allow for cross organizational collaboration? Uh, you have single sign on identity that allows users to uh, log into multiple websites. So you are, in, in some regard, you are an identity provider, right? Uh, so can you speak to the complexity of dealing with identity and kind of this harmonization of policies and standards? When, uh, you know, go ahead. Well, I can certainly uh, provide a, a different type of uh, perspective when it comes to providing uh, enterprise-related services. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about services provided directly to consumers. Um, and how that otherwise would be managed either by the private sector or the government. But we also have this other interesting, very, very substantive area where we have cloud providers providing services to other businesses themselves that may in turn have to manage identities of their employees or their students or their users. So for example, in the Google context, uh, we provide uh, cloud services, uh, it's called Google Apps, to businesses, schools, basically email services, calendaring, the typical type of consumer version services you'd see, but for the enterprise. And the question from Google's perspective is how do we help determine what the identities are of those users without having any direct contact with them? So what we've decided to do when it comes to those services is to give the system administrator or the customer that provide that that acquires the services directly from us, that buys the services from us, complete control over how they want to manage the identities of their own users. So in other words, what we do is we provide them with the tools, a control panel, so to speak, where they provision the accounts. They determine how those identities will be managed for their own domain. They determine uh, what accounts are created, how the accounts are identified, um, uh, um, whether or not they need verification of age, for example, depending on their users. So for example, you could have services that are provided by our customers to children, if it's a school, an elementary school, um, versus uh, adults, or how there would be interaction between the two in a middle school, for example. Um, and what's most important about this is that since this is a global service offering, since we're offering this to businesses or schools um, across the planet, we have to make sure that the provider provides as much flexibility with regards to how those customers comply with their own regulatory requirements in their own jurisdictions. In other words, you have customers that are based virtually in every country in the world, mostly, and they may have their own local or national uh, uh, framework for governing identity. And so Google can't necessarily impose that on the customer when they need to have the flexibility to adopt what uh, a solution, uh, any number of solutions that are discussed here today. So we need to provide that flexibility as the provider take a step back and be able to support whatever they want to try to adopt. And so that's one of our goals from an enterprise perspective. Great, uh, thank you. Yeah, so I think that definitely sums up the difficulty in uh, potentially trying to create a contractual regime dealing with identity at, at the global scale. Um, so uh, another aspect of governing identity are the technical services that underpin all of ident identities online. And I want to ask Robin here, uh, how uh, do you put what we have heard into the context of identity technology? Thank you, Brandon. Um, well, having listened to many people talking about identity here at the IGF this week, um, I've heard so many diverse views about what identity is, that I worry to a certain extent we're talking about governing something of which there are very different definitions and interpretations around every table in this conference hall. So I wanted to step back and just kind of go through a one, two, three of, of, of digital identity. Um, one evolutionary sequence, how did we get to where we are with digital identity? Um, two models of what digital identity is, and then three issues that I think that presents us with. So in terms of evolution, I'll be really quick about this. If I go back to the 80s, if I'd asked you what your identity was then, you probably would have done what both Bill and uh, John have done this morning and probably showed me your passport. 
And if I'd said, no, no, I mean your, I mean your digital identity, um, once, you'd, once you'd erased the frown from your forehead, <laughs> you probably would have said, um, well, I've got an account on a mainframe. Does that count? Or I've got an account, you know, if you're in higher education, I'm, I'm on the university server. Yeah. Um, and that was pretty much it. Um, those digital identities, such as we understood them then, were siloed and they were incomprehensible to other systems, other platforms, and other organizations. Um, by the beginning of this millennium, I started to be expected to use the phrase network identity. Um, I'm not going to try and rehash what I thought a network identity was in 2001 because it would seem very strange to us now, which is an indication of how things have moved quickly. Because by the end of that, by the middle of that decade, as Bill says, it made sense to talk about federated identity, um, at least amongst large enterprises. Um, and in that context, an, a, a, a federated identity was a non-siloed digital credential that could be used to identify you to an organization that hadn't issued it. And that's quite a big step forward. But I think also, as Bill said, the current goal, you could describe the current goal as being internet scale federation. In other words, a framework that can cater for many kinds of credential, understandable by many different organizations, in different sectors for different purposes with different models for trust and liability. And that's the aim of programs such as the US uh, NSTIC program that Naomi described earlier. Um, and there are similar uh, initiatives in other countries, including the UK, for example. Uh, so in short, at this stage, the term digital identity is a goal that we're setting ourselves for an identity that is as, that is as, as multifaceted and versatile in the online world as our personal identity is to us in our real life. That's a very long way from where we were 30 years ago, and let me assure you, we're definitely not there yet. Um, now, I've, I've got several other things that I can come on to say about this, but I think I'd like to, at this stage, hand back to Brandon, and we can come back to my two models of identity um, perhaps a little bit later. Thank you, Robin. Uh, actually, at this point, I'd like to see if there are any questions or comments from the audience. Yep. Uh, microphone. Thank you. If you could please introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi. My name is Centrosa Fernand. I am an attorney in Trinidad and Tobago, and as well, I'm an ITOC token ambassador. Um, my question is relating to e-notaries. Um, we recently uh, um, legislated our Data Protection Act and e-commerce act. And uh, there is provision for e-notaries, but it hasn't been implemented yet. I'd like to know what your experience is with e-notaries, if it's seen as a successful mechanism for, um, for data identity. Yeah, th thank you. That's a, that's a really good question because it draws out some of the, um, some of the ways in which identity has changed over the course of that evolution that I described. Um, so an e-notary um, is someone who can act on behalf of the user. It's an in intermediary, and it's a service that provides some kind of trust benefit, both to the consumer uh, and to the person who's relying on the assertion that the consumer is making via the e-notary. And again, that's, that's a very different ecosystem to just having your identity be an account on one machine because it's got multiple parties in it. They are trusting um, credentials that may not have been issued by them and they are trusting them for multiple purposes. So when you look at that as an example of this new model of identity, um, it, it has some really sharp contrasts with the old model. Um, so for example, um, well, I think, let, let me just pick on the key one. And it is something that Bill alluded to earlier. If I present my passport in order to check into a hotel, sorry, it was John who did. If I present my passport in order to check into a hotel, I'm using the credential for a purpose that is very different to the purpose it was issued for. The point to recognize, and I think the e-notary service is a good example of this, is that you can't stop that from happening. Um, you cannot issue a credential in such a way that it will only ever be used for one purpose. And so that's a reality that we just have to get used to. 
and e-notary services and other intermediary services are a good way to produce uh, to, to introduce that kind of um, what would be the word um, uh, dislocation between the purpose it was issued for and the purpose you want to be able to use it for. Follow up. C can I just make one, one comment and I'll ask the panel's views. The word federated is sometimes a dangerous word to use because it means different things to different people. If you look at the classic situation, the United States of America, there was a very strong federal constitution there. Yet if you look at other nation states coming together in much looser, what you might call bilateral arrangements, island to island to island, as it were, uh, you get a wholly different form of federation in many ways much looser, much more dangerous. And I think we need to be careful in, in the digital identity world that when we talk about federated identity, we, we realize that there are very different ways of, of doing that federation, some which can be great, some which can work very well, but nearly always, if you get a, if nearly always the point of weakness will be where it breaks, and then the, it'll, it'll end up, as it were, in the, in the, deep, in the hands of the deepest pockets. So it's, it's a going across from island to island to island is, is, is a dangerous game, um, depending on what, on what you want to use the credential for. Uh, good point, good point. Um, sure. Yeah, please do. Sure, <laughs> John, so um, uh, I think there are examples of what you described as loose or global federations that um, deliver quite a low level of assurance of identity and examples of island hopping federations that are actually quite high functional. Um, so for example, if you log into things using your Facebook account, I would describe that as a relatively low assurance model, even though it is a very broad um, federation. Um, th there are other instances where I think you can have a high trust relationship with a small number of service providers, um, which as you said, gives you an island to island hop. But if that means that at each island, you can be invoking a different trust model that suits the transaction that you want to undertake, then I think that's actually a, a benefit. Yeah, I, and I, this is Bill Smith from PayPal. I think Robin touches on a, um, an important point, and, and that's, um, th that's around the uh, authorization for me on a, on a specific, for a specific transaction. And we need to be careful and this is not always done in identity discussions. We need to make a, a distinction between authentication or identification right, and authorization. Um, just because you know someone in the real world does not mean, you know, you know someone because you met them yesterday, that doesn't mean you're going to give them the keys to your house, right? You will not authorize them in that manner. Um, you may authorize them to uh, give out your phone number, though. Uh, and if we use the um, social media as an example, um, you know, have a friend. You friend someone, well, you'll give out some of your information. But we, didn't, we just need to be very careful to make the distinction between authentication and authorization. Yeah, so um, the distinction Bill mentions there between authorization and authentication is key to those two models of identity that I was mentioning earlier. So now's probably the right time just to um, to go through those. The first one is the one I'd call a classic model, and it's the, it's the passport model that John and Bill have both alluded to. So the passport model of identity is one that relies on a single authoritative source. You go somewhere, you go through a trusted ceremony, and you're issued with a trustworthy credential. And you then use that credential when you're asked to authenticate yourself. Yeah? The authentication step you go through then is a binary one. It gives a yes or no answer does the person presenting this credential match the credential? And that what you do on, on the basis of that decision is based on a level of assurance and a chain of trust, which are relatively mature things that we understand and which can be formalized into procedures and which can be associated with liability models. And that's John's bread and butter. Yeah. Now, let's contrast that with the authorization step. In the authorization step, Basically, you're saying, okay, you've presented me with a credential. I've got a binary answer. Now that I know that, what do I do? <laughs> okay, now, at this point, you tend to rely on other factors. So, characteristically, the emerging model of identity 
is one that relies on multiple lower assurance sources of data instead of a single high trust source of data. Those low assurance sources will tell you attributes about the person, the transaction, the context in which they're, they're interacting with you. And based on those attributes, you will authorize them to do something or you will refuse them permission. That's not a binary process. It's a very contextual one and it's very adaptive. Rather than being based on a chain of trust from a credential issuing process to credentials to credential presentation, it's based on a web of trust because you're getting information from multiple sources and those sources may have different levels of reliability. It also assumes a changeable reputation of the person that you're dealing with because the way that you react to the attributes you're presented with may well change over time and with, given, uh, with different circumstances. And this discipline is quantifiable mostly in terms of risk management. So instead of liability, which is what you do when something has gone wrong, here we're talking about risk management, which is a guess about what might go wrong in the future. <laughs> yeah. So fundamentally, the classic model is a retrospective one, and this emerging one is a much more adaptive, contextual, forward-looking, risk-based approach. And those are very different disciplines, and the second one is a very immature discipline, and that's why I think it's important we're putting it on the table here. We have someone from the audience. May, may I say something? Yes, Andrea, go ahead. Um, I, I think that um, um, I would like to get back to, to, to what um, was being said about the authorization step. Um, in, in authorization is not necessarily, I suppose, <coughs> always related to, I would say, um, the, um, the step of complementing some sort of, uh, I would say, authentication with lower level assurance the type of information that will make the authorization step to be possible. If I look at an example that has also been prototyped in, in projects, uh, Trust and Digital Life that we have here in Europe, we can build on um, identity, you know, like the passport base one, uh, you know, that was alluded to uh, as the identity provided by a government uh, in those jurisdictions where this is indeed uh, possible. And um, to get the authorization to be associated to trusted assertion that might not even be related uh, to the disclosure of the identity of the person that would be authorized to do something. Let me, let me make me an, an example. If you go if we look at e-gambling, for instance, we need to know in certain jurisdiction that you are uh, of the age high of an age higher than 18, and you are resident in a country because other where the e-gambling service is being provided. These are the only trusted assertion that you need to disclose and to share with the providers. And actually, the e-gambling uh, service provider will be very much. Uh, benefiting from having trusted assertion that will make me to be eligible and so authorized to get the, the service just on the base of some sort of trusted assertion that will make uh, the provider to know that I am high, uh, older than 18 and I'm resi and residing in the country where the, the service is provided. And this is where I think we are trying to build in Europe the type of, I would say, ecosystem, even though I would say is not <coughs> Um, um, so well structured as it is the initiative in the US that will build on the initial element of trusted identity as they are to some extent hooked into the legal system of, uh, of uh, I I individual member states but on top of which uh, private sector is called to, to provide much richer authorization, credential based, uh, or I would say authentication based or reputation based type of services that will make the disclosure of the identity actually to be the last resort instead of being the practice. And this will also make the risk management in connection to the management of personal data to be, I would say, much more, uh, uh, much easier to be tackled by the private sector players that will have to deal with it. Great. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, we have one. Uh, Quick question from the audience. Andrew Cushman with Microsoft. So the, uh, I enjoyed the uh, presentation. I enjoyed the presentation of the two uh, models, 
uh, and it prompts me for to ask two questions. Uh, one is, so imagine we're 10 years in the future or 20 years in the future, and do we think that there will be a, uh, a authoritative issuer of a digital identity at birth, uh, associated with the birthing documents? Uh, and then do we think that there's a, a, a merger of these two models so that there is an authoritative uh, chain a, as well as a web-based one? So Bill Smith <coughs> and Andrew, thank you. Um, as Robin was describing uh, the two models, I, I also hit on the same thing. So I, I actually think they they merge together quite naturally. And um, also while Rob, Robin and I once worked together uh, not too many years ago, um, he didn't set me up for what I'm next going to say, um, and it, but th th it, makes, it may look that way. And that is that um, at PayPal, everything we do is risk-based. Every decision we make is based on risk. And we look at a number of factors to help us determine what the risk is with each transaction. And so it is very important that um, we, are, in addition to distinct, making a distinction between authentication um, and authorization, um, you also need to take into account the risk of that specific transaction. And I do believe that, that the two models, the web model versus the more hierarchical model, uh, can easily be put together. And one is, is this, just put the certificate into one of the things that you know about the person. Um, and if that's coming from a trusted party, trusted by you, um, the supplier of the service, that may lend you to say, well, I have a higher level of assurance about this identity. I may not be, you never have an absolute, right? even with the passport, you do not absolutely know who you are dealing with. There's just no way. So, and that's, that's something we need to, to con also consider is there are no absolutes um, in this, but, I, and I, I'll finish on this, since the dawn of uh, computing and programs, we have assumed absolutely when someone logs into a system that they are who they claim to be. And that's actually a huge mistake we made you know, many years ago, and it persists till today. Thanks. Wendy. Wendy Seltzer, W3C. Um, I like these, the, the framework that you're offering for uh, new ways of thinking about what's constructing the identity. Um, and I'm wondering whether, uh, how that deals with places where we don't want to merge identities or places where it falls short. The, the passport issue of the single authority can put us into the witness protection program and, uh, or give us a new identity or can try unsuccessfully to prevent us from using our uh, official identity for other things. How do we manage anonymity or, or privacy in a world where our identity is created from all of the places where we travel and all of the things we visit and the, the profile built up from the ground? Yeah, thank you. That's a great segue into what I wanted to get into is identity and rights. Um, and I'll turn your question to our panelists. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I also just wanted to come very quickly back to Andrew's question about um, being issued with an identity at birth. You don't need to forward, fast forward 10 years. In New Zealand, they already take a DNA sample at birth, um, and that's registered against the individual. Um, so coming, coming to the other ones, uh, when? Um, yes. Yet. <laughs> yet, yes. Sorry, the, the comment was you can't send that to PayPal, and I think, yeah, it's probably just a matter of time. Um, uh, to Wendy's point on um, anonymity, uh, I absolutely agree. Um, we need to find ways of, of preserving or allowing people to preserve anonymity and pseudonymity, as well as the cases where identified interaction is needed. Um, and the, the attribute-based model is far more capable of supporting anonymous transactions than the, the, the classic model. Um, and and a, a great example is this. Um, for those not in the room, I'm holding up a five-manat banknote from here in Azerbaijan. Um, 
I can give you this, and it's a trusted transaction. It's a trusted assertion of creditworthiness. I, I said I can give you it. <laughs> the Google representative is I immediately reaching his hand out. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, so this, this is an anonymous but trustworthy assertion of creditworthiness to the tune of five manat. <laughs> yeah. um, so the catch with my two model proposal is that it's not an either or decision. We have to become experts in both models because between them, they offer possibilities of addressing the full spectrum of identified pseudonymous and anonymous interactions online. Milwaukee. I just want to, to return to uh, uh, the beginning of that those two models that you presented. That was Robin, right? Um, you, you mentioned the fact that uh, you, you can prevent people to use uh, an identity credential for purposes other than uh, the one for which they have been uh, originally uh, issued. And, uh, and that was a that is a trust a trust feature, if I if I understand well, and that's the kind of situation that leads to what I, I call authoritative identity. Uh, the, the government issued those credentials, the passports, for travel purposes, you know, that control who goes and comes into the territory. Uh, but then, because the other segments, the other uh, the social actors cannot trust the government to be the authoritative source of saying your name is uh, Bill uh, or Rubin XYZ, that you, you are from a certain nationality, which is uh, actually a, a, a very important feature of uh, uh, state-issued identity. Uh, because those actors trust the government to make those assertions, it became the passport became an authoritative identity beyond what was uh, uh, what uh, what they were issued for. Now, do you think? Uh, and uh, uh, forgive me if I ask you a question. Now, do you think? And actually, you just answer partially the question, saying that we need to use those two models to complement uh, uh, one another. Uh, do you think with the web of uh, the, no the web of trust or the risk management model, we can still reach? Uh, authoritative source of identity credential? Uh, I'm, I'm going to twist the question with absolutely no hint of conscience or regret at all. Um, former colleague of mine, Bob Blakely, wrote a, a very challenging paper called, um, which he t called the, the Death of Authentication. And his premise was, we're now at a stage where you can get so much information about someone without making them go through an explicit authentication step that to all intents and purposes, in many situations, you don't need to go through an authentication step. You just, you know where someone is, you've got their location history, um, it couldn't be anyone else because you have so much data that says it is that person. Um, so I think we're just, we're moving into a very different world and we need to update our identity and trust models to, to cope with that and it's, it's tough. Is there a question over here? We can't hear you. The phone's late. Um, I can end POC from the Gambia. Um, I'm, when we look at digital um, identity in certain developing countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, you have problems when you want to do e-transactions, e and it seems that um, those problems are resulted because um, the particular party that you want to try to carry out this e-transaction, especially e-commerce, do not um, trust the identity that you are um, you use to carry those transactions. So, and this has really affected um, e-commerce development in certain areas in Africa because of this um, identity. So, I want to see, uh, as you said, Robbie, about the two models. How do you try to blend it? Because I think it's trying to, it's authentication that I think, um, or is it just a blacklist in people, um, the, um, the people that, are resp that, that actually can fix this are just saying, okay, this part of the world, um, anything from them is no good. Thank you. Um, 
I, I'm getting far too much airtime here, so I'm going to keep this as brief as I can. Um, have a look at um, products that carry out what they call adaptive authentication and, and see what they do. And you'll see the same thing in um, data loss prevention, in intrusion detection, in antivirus software. Increasingly, the systems, rather than rely on a single trusted source, will look for patterns, and then they will look for anomalies, and they will flag anomalies. And that's where I think we're heading with identification and authentication. Uh, so I'm going to move us on, hopefully, to a, a new topic here. <laughs> um, but picking up on what uh, Wendy had said earlier about the aggregation of data, uh, and um, I wanted to get some perspective on how a company that does aggregate a lot of data about its users um, uh, is coping with this problem. So uh, in July of this year, I think the Article 29 Working Party in, uh, in Europe provided some guidance associated with cloud services. Uh, and were there particular insights that you gained from that uh, guidance regarding online identity, privacy, other issues? Y yes, the uh, Article 29 Working Party issued um, their opinion, as, we, as, as you mentioned in July, uh, regarding uh, enterprise or, 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 or business or schools' uses of cloud computing services. Um, when the EU Data Protection Directive was created in 1995, this was long before, of course, people had anticipated the use of cloud services, uh, other online services, or probably the public use of the internet, really, at the time. It was a little bit early for that, particularly when it was being delivered, uh, um, when it was being discussed. With regards to online identity management, the directive doesn't speak directly to that, but they do provide guidelines for for individuals, enterprises, customers that want to utilize cloud services. They think that a risk assessment needs to be made with regards to how that corpus of personal data, which will be trusted to the cloud provider, which includes, of course, the authentication and identifying information about users that we're talking about here, would be maintained. Um, some of the examples they talked about with regards to making sure that data, once it's collected and used, is protected uh, are things like um, cloud customer needs to make sure that the provider um, maintains adequate security measures. And so they, they require that the customer um, either review third-party audits of the provider, make some sort of uh, affirmation that they maintain a, some sort of security certification, like ISO 27001. Um, they should uh, make a determination regarding uh, how the data is processed with regards to uh, safeguards uh, concerning the user's privacy that would otherwise be stored in those systems. So there's no direct correlation to the, uh, the use of online identities, but uh, there, there are guidelines with regards to how that information, what's col once collected and maintained, must be protected to, uh, to, to rise to European standards. Great. Um, and so I'd like to turn to Malavika, actually, uh, who uh, has followed the Adhar effort in India and which will likely result in uh, one of the world's largest private biometric databases, a uh, collection of bio biometric data, rather. Um, there are some initial indications that the ADHAR system uh, credentials are expanding. That is, uh, for instance, a mobile operator recently is now using the ADHAR card for subscriber verification, potentially tying a biometric identity to online behavior. Um, this is new ground. Can you share some concerns uh, about uh, Actually, before I do that, um, I wanted to respond to your question from the Gambia. Um, in one of the things that we've seen in India is that because you have a lack of baseline documents that establish your identity in the first place before you can even get into a system that authenticates you or issues you a government-recognized identity, there are two things that you see. One is that in the case of the Aadhaar effort, which is our unique ID system, um, they've introduced this really weird thing called an introducer system. So the assumption is you don't have documents, you don't have a passport, you're a villager living you know, below the poverty line, you don't have anything that can make you visible to the state. So you need the identity, but you have this chicken and egg problem where you can't establish X is X in order to then verify that he is who he is. So if you can't prove you have any of the baseline documents, you can actually have someone introduce you and say, I've known this guy for 15 years, give him, a, give him an ID. So of course you have a whole gray market in people 
saying, yeah, I've known this guy for 50 years, you know, and you're 25 years old. But, you know, you, and you actually had an instance where a doctor in Delhi was taken to court because he thought he was performing a public service by pretending to know a whole bunch of his patients um, just so they could get an ID because nobody else would verify them. So that's one of the weird things you have when in a developing country you don't have ways of verifying identity. You, th this is one of the sort of weird solutions you come up with. And the other thing which I wanted to say is to kind of paper over this gap um, and to fill this vacuum, you suddenly introduce the idea of biometrics, which will unambiguously identify you, saying you don't have paperwork, but you have irises and fingerprints, so you know we, we, we can see that you are who you are. And I think that makes the case for biometrics extremely compelling in a country like India and in a lot of developing countries. But it also carries a whole bunch of risks and privacy implications, because one of the risks is when you have a scheme that specifically says it wants to target um, the poor people and when it has a welfare, sort of an overarching welfare motive, the idea is to roll it out to as many people as possible. But your main target audience poses the greatest difficulties to biometrics because they're manual laborers who have what they call poor quality fingerprints. So that causes an issue both in terms of authentication as well as every transaction. I mean, you, you have a very high false acceptance and rejection rate. And it's the same with iris scans because a lot of people due to malnutrition have cataracts. So again, the, the, the technology that's allegedly foolproof isn't as foolproof as it should be. And you're dealing with a population size that's never been tested. None, none of the technology has been tested on this scale. And even though we've only enrolled, only I say, only enrolled 250 million so far, um, it's already the biggest biometric identity project ever when we haven't even finished. We still have another 750 million to go. Um, so, I mean, these are some of the weird um, instances we have where there is this huge motive to authenticate and identify people, and there is this rhetoric of inclusion. And one of the things that I have difficulty with is, you know, we, we've sort of passed various semantics in terms of federated and identity. Um, Identity for me poses a huge problem because the authority keeps talking about we want to give everyone in India an identity. And you have everyone in civil society jumping up saying everyone in India already has an identity. You might want to give them identification. You know, So it, it becomes a very political civil rights kind of issue as well, saying whether or not your stupid government recognizes them and acknowledges that they exist, they still have an identity. You know, They may not be visible to you. And one of the other terms that keeps getting thrown about is they want to make everyone bankable, which again, I have an issue with because I think, great, you give them bank accounts and you want to give them a way to put some money in it first. How about we solve the real problems instead of just giving them a tool to then uh, you know, fix poverty, wealth, wealth um, disparities and food, shelter, safety, all the other things that usually trump privacy. Um, so was there anything specific? Well, um, in terms of uh, how we protect rights with regard to identity management systems, I mean, there are a variety of ways we can go about it. Mark mentioned a regulatory regime that's providing guidance. Um, are there any protections around the ADHAR system for rights um, in place? So one of the objections that we had was that India was rolling out this program when we didn't have a data protection framework. We don't have a dedicated data protection law. Um, we have a patchwork of legislation that deals with it. So it could be through consumer protection, it could be through our IT Act, it could be through the Telegraph Act, which dates from 1885, which hasn't been changed. So we, we have a whole bunch of clauses that speak to privacy or speak to protecting data, but not in the EU or the US sense of an actual data protection law. Um, so it's not even vertical or horizontal, it's just a complete mess. But um, one of the things that happened is, so whatever my misgivings about the other system, and I have many, um, it's actually raised the profile of privacy in the public consciousness. It's actually created a debate around having data protection law and having a privacy framework. So I think one of the great side effects of all the governance schemes that we're seeing is we might end up with a more robust data protection law. 
And recently we've had, um, so the government, the government rejected the UID bill that was put before parliament. So the, the weird thing is this program was being implemented without it having gone to parliament. So it had no constitutional sanction. Um, but subcontracts were being given, money was being paid, taxpayers' money was being spent, people's iris scans were being taken without it having technically any kind of legal sanction. So in order to fix that, a bill was proposed before parliament which then included a whole bunch of data protection provisions. But I think the issue there was that it, it, there was a conflict of interest because you're introducing data protection law in a scheme that has a particular agenda to start with. So it's not a generic law that applies across the country for every kind of use of data. It's particularly tied to a scheme and is therefore self-serving in a sense. So that bill was thrown out and instead the government set up a committee to look at whether India needs a separate privacy law and that report was published, well it was made available to the government about two and a half weeks ago and the committee has actually looked at what the OECD has done, what the APEC principles are, um, what a whole host of other countries have done in implementing different kind of models and has made a few recommendations on the nine privacy principles that they want to apply in India across every sector and every kind of transaction and um, they've made a whole bunch of recommendations about what a data protection and privacy law in India should look like, what a data protection commissioner should look like and what kind of self-regulation you can also have and, and co-regulation to complement this system. A quick question. Thank you. Um, the Gambia is one of the um, few countries in Africa that has fully implemented its um, biometric identification system, both for national ID card and driving license. But there's an issue I, I would like to get the opinion in India because with, within the biometric um, driving license, the, um, they placed you to place your blood type. And a lot of people were complaining about it. So the government, um, they said, oh, it's, it's their privacy for their blood type, um, not to give, for them not to give out their, um, their blood type. So some people were either giving wrong blood type um, numbers, um, I mean letters there, A or AB. Oh. And then the government said, okay, we are, we, are, we are having problems because someone had an accident and his, they took his driving license, he needed blood, and he was given the wrong blood because it was the wrong um, blood type he placed in his information. And the person lost his life because of, of that. And then the government said, okay, now, since people are doing this, we are not forcing anybody who wants to get a new ID card to place your um, um, blood type group. Now the issue, I think, um, my question is, is it, do, do you think governments that introduce this system, do they need to do more advocacy? Or you think it's a privacy issue? I, I want to know how, maybe, because you have a bigger, Gambia is 1.8 million from your experience. Thank you. I think the government feels that privacy is something that is inconvenient. It needs to be looked at, but it's not the primary concern because there are so many values that are more important um, in a scheme like this that they think privacy can fall by the wayside or they will pay lip service to it and say, yes, we must have a framework, we must have protection. But there's always this sense that there is a welfare impetus that overrides this. There is a need to identify people um, and there's a need to include them in the success story and the growth story of the country. So I think those kind of values usually trump the privacy argument. So I would just quickly add that um, in terms of institutionalizing privacy concerns in identity governance framework uh, institutions that are emerging, uh, actually NSTIC uh, makes an explicit call for privacy as part of the strategy. And beyond that has actually institutionalized a privacy committee that actually reviews any recommended policies or standards that emerge from the, from the governance structure. So that in of itself, I think, uh, in looking at other internet governance institutions, that's uh, kind of a novelty <laughs> at this stage, but um, uh, it's, it's a positive development for sure. Um, so we have about a minute and a half left. Uh, if anyone has any quick, uh, quick statements that they would like to make, um, feel free. Go ahead. Uh, two quick statements. <laughs> 
Uh, the first one is to say, uh, to concur with uh, the case in Gambia. Um, uh, personally, when I'm in New York trying to book uh, a flight, for example, on Emirates, not to uh, make any publicity, uh, I can pay with my credit card from New York. But when I'm in Accra and I go online to book uh, a flight with them, uh, they don't, uh, it doesn't work. They don't set my credit card. I have to walk to the office with my passport and a credit card to be able to make that transaction. Uh, second, I think uh, as we discuss, uh, I, I come to believe that, uh, to, to, to understand in my view, that in fact, even the, um, the uh, trust, the chain of trust model that we had with uh, uh, government issued identity, actually, w they were possible because of a set of assumptions. Uh, in fact, as someone pointed out, uh, even uh, the passport is not 100% reliable. With the digital identity uh, framework or environment, we kind of understand because of uh, the multiple sources of risk, understand that in fact the, the, the paradigm that, would, that should have been actually in, in, in currency uh, ever since whenever you talk about identity should be risk management. So uh, the uh, model of uh, uh, trends and patterns and trying to detect what, what whatever anomaly may be, uh, I think that model probably will need to evolve and be refined as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, Bill Smith, real quickly, wanted to follow up on Wendy's question um, and point out that um, in, in terms of privacy um, and disclosure of PII, the, the, per the, the solution, I think, to that problem is, is to place the control of who can access that information under under the uh, the control of the user themselves, um, and I want to point out there's a uh, a working group at Cantara called User Managed Access that you know, explicitly works on this issue um, based on OAuth 2, and uh, allows you to to be able to say yes this this service provider can have access to this piece of information one time on a continuing basis, etc. And that, that's, that's something I think that we need to look at uh, going forward is placing the control where it really belongs, not with the identity provider, but with the user. Great. Uh, that, I think that's a very nice place to end up with the user in control. <laughs> um, and I'm going to put you guys in control of going to lunch now. So uh, if you'll take a moment and uh, help me thank our panelists. And thank, thank you, and uh, have a good IGF.